inviting me to, to speak today. Um, I'm going to give a, a I'm going to go back to basics uh, really, and I'm going to take you through um, what we do, how we're coping with digital data from the point of view of um, a contractor. And I work for Wessex Archaeology. I've worked for Wessex Archaeology for more years than I care to remember. Um, and I've been dealing with uh, archives for uh, more than 30 years. So that's, that period has seen a lot of change. Um, primarily in recent years, it's seen the growth of the use of digital data. So that's what I'm going to be concentrating on today. I'm going to be fairly brief, and you'll be glad of that because I'm giving one of those presentations which I most despise, which is full of bullet points. But uh, there's a limit to the amount of uh, photos of people staring at screens that I can shoehorn in. Um, so what I'm going to do, what I took as my structure, was um, some of the questions that were posed by the call for papers. And the first one of those was, um, how well are organisations adapting to the burgeoning requirements of digital archiving? Well, it would be quite tempting to say that um, some of us aren't, or at least we're not doing it very well. Um, but that's a bit defeatist, a bit simplistic, and it's not necessarily accurate, as we're hearing this morning. We all know that development-led archaeology has uh, generated vast quantities of digital data and has done now for several decades. But the steps made to get to grips with that digital data have been lagging behind, at least um, from, for some of our, uh, us contractors. In recent years, with the support of ADS, contractors have made some progress in the deposition of digital archives, but it's, it's still a bit patchy, as I'm sure you'll agree. So what are the existing barriers to digital deposition what progress have we made recently? And what do we still need to do? This overview, as I've said, comes from the viewpoint of uh, Wessex Archaeology, a large contractor. Um, and the picture isn't a, a, at all gloomy by any means. So let's start by looking at some of the challenges to adaptation. First of all, the existing physical back, uh, backlog, uh, which many of us larger contractors certainly face. Um, and uh, in order to um, uh, deal with our burgeoning storage cost and space limitations, we're obliged to deal with that physical backlog, and so we have less time to devote to, to digital archives. This, of course, in turn is linked to under-resourced uh, archive teams. I'm sure that chimes with a lot of you. We don't have enough staff to deal efficiently with the output of our organisation and also to cope with the backlog. Cost is an obvious challenge, and resistance from clients to pay for these burgeoning costs, despite, uh, for example, the reduction in cost for ADS easy deposition. And this squeeze on costs, I'm afraid, is, is possibly going to become more of a challenge in the current economic climate. The perceived excessive time costs for archive preparation to meet requirements and bespoke deposition and that's in addition to the deposition fees themselves. And I stress that this is a perception of excessive cost. It doesn't come from us archivists, it comes from others uh, within the organisation and outside. There is the potential to hold back the innovative use of um, technology. For example, photogrammetry, if archiving it is too costly for the project. And then there's the added challenges of retrofitting project data to open source archival format. And the friction between data innovators and data curators can lead to resistance. There's also software challenges with lack of program solutions, engagement for software providers to update or fix problems. And yes, I'm talking about you, Adobe, or alternatives in the market. There's also the opposite problem of constant updates that fix nothing and make everything more complex. And that means you, Microsoft. <laughs> the result of all this leads to an overarching challenge to meet requirements and mitigate them cost effectively, which in turn necessitates restructuring, digitization of data collection and processing workflows and retraining. Well, so far, so depressing, but I can report that we have made and continu continue to make organisational progress, albeit slowly. 
So in general terms, we've been able to expand our archive team at Wessex. We now have archive staff in three of our offices, and this includes staff who are largely dedicated to digital archiving. It's probably still not enough, but it's better than it was. With a larger team comes a higher profile, and we're very lucky to have a supportive head of department who contributes to organisational policy and will fight our corner. And we also have, for the most part, and I'll stress that, project managers who understand that archiving costs continue to rise and are prepared to defend that to clients, and that's particularly important. And I accept that this is possible for a large contractor, might not be so easy for the, for the smaller organisations. Archiving costs form a proportion of all our budgets at tender stage. Having said that, this still definitely disadvantages smaller projects where margins are smaller and archiving costs are often disproportionately high. So, turning to specifics... Um, we've made significant progress in the controlled digitisation of field records. No, that's the wrong one. Sorry, go back. Uh, we've made significant progress in the controlled digitisation of field records and the centralisation of data collection and post-excavation databases. So all our sites now record digitally. We use tablets on site, uh, with the exception of registers. Uh, we still do a little hand drawing, um, but it's increasingly being uh, replaced by survey data and or photogrammetry. Our site records are uploaded into a database which links with the finds data um, and with a GIS system. So we can now pull everything in. We can link site plans to site records and also to the finds. Um, we still do analogue x-rays, Claire. Um, I'm delighted to see you're paving the way for us to uh, sorting out all the issues. <laughs> um, we're now uh, testing software to enable the production of ADS photographic metadata in deposition format. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that the creation of photographic metadata is enormously time consuming, um, even when selection is taken into account. So as we envisage it, and I stress we're not there yet, the new system would involve just the click of a button once, once photographs have been contextualised and post-excavation phasing completed. We've also set up a cross-departmental de uh, data curation review to assess and address the challenges of marrying the process with the digital requirements of the company, wider public and digital repositories. And the remit of this review includes data collection, processing, storage, dissemination, sustainability and responsible disposal. And it has an end, visage, uh, an end vision of open source formats, linked open data connectivity, internal and external reuse functionality and mitigation of archive production cost. And at this stage, I'd really like to acknowledge the, the help and support of the ADS. We've been working with them for a number of years now. We've always found them really helpful. It's always useful to have somebody to bounce ideas off and know that they can make pragmatic and flexible decisions. So that's a great vision. Um, we're not there yet. Um, so to achieve our goals, what do we need? Well, first of all, we need to decide what metadata we need to collect and how we envision, envision collecting it, using and disseminating it, and not just for archiving. And we need to embed the metadata uh, production in the process so we don't have to do it all at the end with all the problems that that entails. We need to restructure field-to-office process in alignment with digital recording and post-ex functionality, without de-skilling or straight-jacketing staff or innovation. We'd really like all staff, that's field and office-based, to participate in and learn from the process, because it's only by doing this that they can take um, that knowledge back to the field and enrich their, their experience there. More informed field staff, of course, mean better field records and eventually more accessible archives. And we should embrace new technology, just, not just for the sake of it, and certainly not without thinking through the implications for archiving, but with specific improvements in mind. We need to link site photos with project strat stratigraphy, site survey, and the scanned archive more effectively. 
we need to create controlled mechanisms for data flow and storage and retention alongside process. Perhaps most important, we need to engage staff with the process and the benefits of this process, otherwise none of it is going to work. And we need to provide a framework for managed oversight. OK, the next question I'd like to consider um, is uh, to do with data management plans. Um, how widely are these being adopted and is the implementation of such plans enacted throughout a project or applied retrospectively at the end? And I'll briefly give, us, give you um, our own experience here. Um, interested, Claire, to, to hear about your technique-based DMPs. That's something we're, we're going to have to consider, I think. So currently, um, data management plans are produced uh, at Wessex where required at WSI stage, written scheme of investigation stage. We're currently interpreting these documents as pretty generic at that stage, at least at project outset. We have a basic DMP template and we're currently working on producing more specific templates for various fieldwork types. So that's standard fieldwork, geo-arc, building recording, etc., etc. We're looking towards a system of project-specific DMP templates for inclusion in WSI appendices. But as I said, at this stage of the project, it's difficult to make them anything other than generic. The same is true of our selection strategies at project outset. The DMPs are then updated at least at the end of the data gathering stage, i.e. at assessment level or equivalent, and then again, if necessary, at the end of the project. I'll be interested to know how this chimes with other people's experience in other organisations. So the next question is, do we have the resources in place to properly archive all the digital data being generated? Well, first of all, I think we shouldn't be archiving all the digital data being generated. That's why we have selection and retention procedures. It isn't sustainable or even desirable to retain it all from a research perspective, let alone a commercial one. And there are still far too many instances of this statement, archiving all digital data, being made in museum deposition and other guidelines. And I think we really do need to clarify it i.e. all digital deposit, uh, data should be deposited subject to the standard procedures of selection. And, dare I say it, perhaps we should be asking the question, do we really need to deposit digital data for every evaluation and watching brief? We now have guidance on sterile projects, but there are an awful lot of very minor fieldwork projects that just don't provide any significant information that can't be gleaned adequately from the site report. An OASIS record with report, possibly with extra photographs, could probably suffice in an awful lot of cases. But to return to the question um, posed initially and to reword it slightly, no, we don't have the resources in place to properly archive all the digital data being deposited. In our view, ADS should be centrally funded in the same way as the Welsh and Scottish data repositories, but that's very unlike with the, unlikely with the current government's agenda. And I first wrote this a couple of months ago, so it's even less likely now. <laughs> also, sadly, anything that makes the archaeological process more expensive is only likely to fuel more planning and or educational reforms to try and squeeze archaeology completely out of the planning and educational spheres. One more question. As well as future archiving requirements, what future do existing archives have? What level of engagement is being seen? And is this affected by the way in which they are stored and curated? To, to our mind, the lack of central funding means that ADS is very much just a data repository and has little funding to make project collections engaging or very user friendly, maybe being unfair here. For these extras, it is forced to charge additional fees, which is not palatable to clients in most cases. Who pays? Should we as contractors be doing more to engage the public and others ourselves? We have made one attempt in recent months to get one such project off the ground with the aim of maximising archive use and reuse and value both to Wessex archaeology and the local community. So in 2021, we became aware that the audience agency had partnered with the National Archives 
in securing national lottery funding under the Digital Skills for Heritage Fund. It offered funding and support to 10 to 15 action research projects that would use digital technology in some way to engage communities with archiving or with archive collections. So we identified a particular fieldwork project that we thought might engage a local community and for which we also identified an appropriate community interest group. Our proposed pilot project aimed to explore the potential for adding digital value to existing archaeological reporting text through getting the community involved in archaeological uh, digital archiving under our guidance. The community engagement was to take the form of collaborative or individual tagging of the archaeological report text using the text encoding initiative TEI standards. This process could be undertaken either online or uh, during in-person workshops or community events or a mixture of these depending on the size of the report or the archaeological project involved. We're also looking at the possibility of collaborative manual processing of archaeological reporting text using AI named entity recognition tagging in a community trust engagement setting. And we also hoped that the, the project might create a model for digital community engagement with archaeological archives <laughs> and reporting text, uh, which could then be adopted more widely. But also, and this will particularly benefit us, if the project was expanded, there would be the potential to build a data set of TEI tagged archaeological reports, which could then be enmeshed with existing linked open source data sets to facilitate digital access to the Wessex back catalogue uh, as a research resource. And for the community engagement groups, the training in digital archiving preparation and deposition would encourage national digital archiving standards more widely and the appreciation of the existing digital resource. It would also increase the digital value of project archives and foster potential for uh, future reuse by these groups. You may have guessed that I've cribbed this entirely from our application. Unfortunately, in this in instance, our application was unsuccessful, but that's not to say that similar initiatives might not succeed in the future, and we'd certainly be up for giving it another try. I guess my conclusion to all this would be that we've made and continue to make progress with digital archiving. I'll make the same plea as I've made before uh, several times, which is please let's be honest about the cost of digital archiving. And here's a handy crib chart that we issue to our project managers so they can see what it really costs, not just to deposit digital data, but also to prepare it. And you can see there's a sort of sliding scale of both uh, preparation costs and deposition costs. Um, and I think that demonstrates that it does cost proportionately more for smaller projects than it does for larger projects. So, my conclusions. Um, as well as recognising the real cost of digital archiving, let's also try and recognise where we can legitimately streamline the process and maybe think honestly about how significant or valuable or not some of the data that we produce really is. There are clearly some challenges ahead, not least funding, but I believe we're now in a better, better position to help shape the future of digital archiving in archaeology. And that's it from me. And to misquote Mr. Bennett in Pride and Prejudice, I have delighted you long enough and I must, must let others have time to exhibit. And it really is goodbye for me this time as I'm leaving Wessex Archaeology on Friday after 37 years. Um, and while I'm sure I will retain an interest in archives, um, I'm no longer going to be taking an active role. So I wish you all the very best of luck and may you all live long enough to see your backlogs deposited. <laughs> Thank you.